Ride restraints come in many different shapes and sizes and can be as simple as a door or a seatbelt. Many use a combination of different restraint types to safely secure riders. Today we'll be taking a deep dive into the different types of restraints used on rides today, as well as the history of ride restraints in general. We'll also be looking at official guidelines for restraint design and how they affect the rides that you enjoy. When the very first rides were being made, they didn't have any restraints. Heck, you were lucky if you even got a seat. This was okay though, as for a time rides were not intense enough to need anything more significant. In the 1920s, rides, especially roller coasters, began getting more intense. This led to the creation of the grab bar. This was just a bar that riders were expected to hold on to. Some old roller coasters, such as the Jackrabbit at Kennywood, still use these grab bars, though most have also had seatbelts added over the years. In the years surrounding World War II, cheap, small rides were the heart of the industry, and Early Aircraft Company, which was actually a rides manufacturer at this time, would lead the industry. They were making the most intense rides yet seen in the mass market, and they needed restraint systems that could keep up. Their solution, that can be seen on many rides such as their Roloplane, was a cage with a door and a grab bar attached to that door. With this system, it was not possible for a rider to accidentally escape the restraints. This also sparked the idea for the adjustable lap bar. In the 1960s, rides were becoming more intense and more people were wanting to ride them. This prompted the invention of the adjustable lap bar. These are not even remotely similar to modern lap bars. The first adjustable lap bars only had two positions they could lock in, open and closed. These types of lap bars can still be found on some PTC coasters and are commonly called buzz bars, and they can also be found on some older aero mine train coasters. This design's largest flaw was the one-size-fits-all approach they took. This means that the restraints may be really tight on a larger rider and dangerously loose on a smaller rider. This is why most rides that still have these restraints have seat belts or another backup restraint. In Arrow's case, their design had one major flaw. The restraints were spring-loaded so that their default position was open rather than closed. This means that these restraints occasionally have issues opening during the ride cycle. Mind you, this only applies to really old Aero Mine trains and not the newer ones. These restraints work by having a set of lap bars attached to a bar underneath the train. When the lap bar got to the closed position, a notch in the bar underneath the train would mesh with a ratchet built into the train and this would hold the bar in place for every seat in the car. The restraints could be opened by use of a pedal at the front of the car that would disengage this ratchet. The PTC design used a similar system, but it was not set to open by default, meaning their restraint was significantly safer. Coaster and ride innovation didn't stop in the 1960s though. In fact, the 1970s saw the introduction of the most intense rides yet, rides that went upside down. This prompted Arrow to design a completely new design of restraint, an over-the-shoulder restraint. This would work by securing the rider's upper body rather than their lower body. With this design being inherently more restrictive, the one-size-fits-all approach that had been used for almost the entire history of ride design would have to be abandoned. Arrow ended up inventing the multi-position restraint. On Arrow's original design, this would work by having each restraint connected to its own vertical bar with notches in it behind the seat. This bar would raise and lower with the over-the-shoulder restraint. Behind the seat, there were also a set of notched locking pins that when locked would prevent the bar from moving down, but would allow it to move up. This meant that the restraint could go down during the ride, but not up. This allowed for the new restraints to lock in around 10 different positions rather than just one. The first rides to use this design had the same design flaw as Arrow's older restraints, with the locking pins being spring-loaded to the unlocked position, meaning the restraints required pressure, in this case a locked pedal, to remain locked. This was done for easier loading and unloading at the time, as Arrow had not yet developed a way to unlock restraints without an operator present. Other manufacturers would take this design and make changes and improvements. Arrow would end up adding a pneumatically raisable bar to coaster track in the station in the late 1970s. This eliminated the need for operators to unlock restraints at the end of every ride cycle. This meant that Arrow restraints suddenly became much safer, as they now required outside pressure to unlock rather than to stay locked and Arrow ended up transferring the same design to their coasters with lap bars. This meant that restraints that could adjust to each individual rider were now the norm. In the 1980s, hydraulic restraints started being used. These restraints have slowly become the most common type used in the industry, with them slowly overtaking the ratcheting style restraints Arrow pioneered. These restraints have the advantage of locking in any position, rather than just a few set positions like a ratcheting restraint. 
They work by having one or more aircraft-grade hydraulic solenoids connected to a ride's restraint. Once an electrical signal is given, they can lock or sometimes allow themselves to lower, but not raise. These are often used on the most intense rides in the world. As we'll discuss in a moment, these rides fall under Class 5 of the American Standards for Testing and Materials, or ASTM, category, meaning that restraints on these rides have several requirements, including that they have to be independently redundant. Many modern hydraulic restraints fill this requirement by having two independent hydraulic solenoids that secure each restraint. As the 1980s rolled around, changes were in the wind for the world of ride safety. It would be in this time that the ASTM F24 committee would be established. ASTM F24 was formed to focus on amusement ride safety as it pertains to their design and operation. These standards are voluntary, but since their introduction, they've become required by over 30 U.S. states. Accordingly, almost all ride manufacturers soon began following these standards. ASTM breaks rides into five categories, with corresponding restraint design requirements depending on the predicted forces the ride will subject riders to. These categories range from no restraints for rides that have very little changes in acceleration, to redundant restraints that secure the rider in multiple ways when rides experience strong negative Gs. The chart that shows this can be seen here. Going into every detail would warrant its own video, and if you're interested, I'd be happy to do one. To understand this better, on a basic level, let's take an example ride. For this example, let's take a Zamperla skater coaster. Think Pipe Scream at Cedar Point or Surf Dog at Kings Island. Let's plot the ride on this chart. Thanks to GeForce Productions for the actual GeForce readings from Pipe Scream, measured on a smartwatch. These were measured on an end seat of the ride, meaning GeForces here should be some of the highest on the entire ride. Let's start by placing it on the chart. Using the ride's lowest recorded negative g-forces of 0.43, or about half the force of gravity at rest, and the ride's maximum negative acceleration of minus 0.21, we can see that places this ride squarely within the Class 2 restraint category. There are some other considerations for lateral g-forces that we'll look at in a moment as well. Let's take a look at what's required for a Class 2 restraint. The restraint on Class 2 rides is actually not even required if handrails are provided for riders to brace, but Zamperla did include restraints. For them to be considered Class 2 restraints, they can lock in either a fixed position or a variable one. In this case, the ride uses hydraulic variable restraints that can lock in a variety of positions. The restraints can be designed for individual riders or for multiple riders. On this ride, the restraints consist of one single lap bar for the entire row of six riders. The restraints on the skater coaster also satisfy the remaining requirements for Class 2 restraints. In fact, it satisfies all the requirements for Class 3 restraints as well, as the lap bars can lock in multiple positions and it's required to be checked by the ride's operator prior to the start of the ride. Keep in mind that restraints are often overbuilt, as they need to secure riders both during the normal ride cycle and during abnormal ones. For example, if the ride were to come to a sudden stop, the restraints must be designed to still secure riders in this case. Regarding lateral forces, ASTM requires special considerations for rides that exert more than 0.5 Gs of lateral force. On the ride we have recorded, the ride got close to this with 0.44 Gs. With high lateral Gs, ASTM requires that special consideration be given to the design of the seats. On these rides, a seat divider exists in the form of a small bump between seats that helps prevent riders from sliding to the side. The ride also features tall walls and a gate at each end of the rider vehicle. As you can see, the Zamperla Skater Coaster is more than compliant with ASTM regulations. But this same analysis can be done for any ride or roller coaster, and keep in mind that this is just the start of ASTM rules. Before we conclude, let's look at two more rides with more controversial restraints. New Texas Giant in its original configuration and Orlando Freefall. It's safe to say that these rides fall under Class 5, as both likely exert more than negative 0.2 Gs. Let's examine the requirements of a Class 5 restraint. It must be variable in position and designed for just one rider. So far, both these restraints comply with this. The restraint must be automatically locked and controlled by the operator. These restraints did comply with this as well. The restraints must have some outside way of seeing if a restraint is secured. Both Orlando Freefall and the original Texas Giant had this in the form of seat sensors that talked to the ride's control system. When operating properly, if a restraint was not in the proper position, this system would stop the ride from starting. Finally, redundancy is required. This can be in the form of two independent restraints or in the form of a single fail-safe restraint. 
Both Orlando Freefall and Texas Giant received criticism for only having one restraint and not a redundant seatbelt. Let's see if this single restraint on these rides could be called failsafe. According to ASTM, a failsafe is designed as a quote, characteristic of amusement rider device or component thereof that is designed such that the normal and expected failure mode results in a safe condition. The restraints on these two rides use two independent hydraulic cylinders, so that if one were to fail completely, the other would still function as intended, meaning that both these restraints were fully ASTM compliant. In these two examples, the adjustment of the restraints monitoring system from the manufacturer's design was the cause of the accidents associated with these rides. I've made full videos covering these accidents in more detail. If you'd like to see a video diving deeper into the ASTM rules and looking at more rides for examples, let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you learned something, as I know I did making it. We didn't cover everything, but I hope we provided a good flyover of restraint design and history. If you're curious about how restraints are released on modern rides, I made a simpler video a few years ago explaining how that works that you can watch here. As always, thanks for watching and see you next time.